Welcome everyone, I'm Philippe Lafoucrier, I'm a Distinguished Engineer in the Secure Team and today we're going to talk about Docker in Docker and why it matters for the Secure Team and for all customers. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Can you see that as well, the whole presentation? Awesome, so let's get started. I have a few slides before opening the questions. Um, we are going to go through why we are using Docker in Docker in the secure team, why it's important for us. Um, how do you set up that with a GitLab runner? If you use GitLab.com, obviously you don't have anything to do, but the point here is to deal with the, with the customer setup and how to uh, end up getting started and work faster. Sorry. Uh, we will go Common pitfalls that we've seen so far, uh, real quick, uh, and make sure that <clears throat> you understand the the, the, the world architecture and uh, and why it's not working sometimes. Uh, just a few words at the end to explain why we want to get rid of Docker and Docker. Um, that's going to be interesting with the live team. So, what do we use Docker and Docker uh, in the security products? We use that. Uh, first of all, in a few uh, products, not all of them, uh, currently SAS dependency scanning and controller scanning. Uh, for SAS and dependency scanning, we use that because we need to have a kind of orchestration layer where, uh, the, the, for example, the SAS job is kind of an empty shell that will just uh, detect and um, be able to map the, the languages and uh, the frameworks that we're using in the project with the analyzers that are available. So based on that, it's going to download and run the analyzers locally with the, the Chrome project, gather all the results into a single output format and output that format to create the report. So we could achieve the same actually without this orchestration layer, but we still miss a few features like ignoring some path or aggregating uh, the, the analyzers together. To, today, it's only possible to have one analyzer running at a time if you don't have the, this kind of orchestration in place. Uh, we also do, do that because we don't want to have a huge single image where we would have everything. Also because it might introduce some new unexpected behaviors like, for example, tomorrow we want to uh, support a new field framework for PHP and that framework is relying on some not GS dependencies and the versions that we have in the image are not exactly the versions that would be compatible with this new framework. So it's going to create uh, incompatibilities inside this image and on top of that, it would end up with a single huge image uh, that would be updated every time we want to update something in any of the tools. So that's uh, absolutely not something that we want to, to do right now. Um, container scanning is a bit different. We need the Docker server uh, to run the Claire analyzer. Claire is going to then locally the image and analyze the layers. There are some ways to deal with that uh, other than having a Docker server, but it's a bit more work and we're not there yet. So we have some issues to uh, avoid that, but um, it's going to be a bit more complex than just uh, SAS and dependency scanning. Uh, really quick, how to get started on GitLab CI. So quick reminder on how Docker is running. Docker, it's, it, it's a client server application. Keep that in mind. When you type Docker into your, uh, your terminal, you actually use the client version of Docker, but this client is completely useless without the server. So you need a server to run the containers and to make sure that the images are stored uh, somewhere, etc. So the server will be in charge of managing the networks, the containers, the images, and the data stores. Uh, by default, Docker listens on a socket instead of a port. It has been the case for a few years now for security reasons. Uh, it's generally this file that we have here. It can change from one system to another, but it's commonly uh, the, this file uh, that, that we're seeing nowadays. Uh, the Docker client will use this socket by default unless you have a Docker host environment variable specified. 
it's uh, the case, for example, in some jobs, and especially with, uh, with other DevOps, if you have runners running on the Kubernetes cluster or that kind of things, you need to set up Docker a, a bit differently. Uh, something that you have to keep in mind as well, Docker requires a lot of capabilities in, the, in your system and it has to run as root. So the Docker server always run as root. That's important for the rest of this, uh, this speculation. Uh, getting back to GitLab runner, this is how you configure a privileged GitLab runner because this is the requirement. If you want to run Docker in Docker, you need a privileged GitLab runner. And this is, I would say, the top one pitfall that we're seeing when something is not working with the security product, it's because you don't have this privileged line inside your runner's configuration. So that's the key point here. And you use that actually, uh, the second part of the, this page is actually um, a GitLab CI ML5, where you can use a Docker service and you can see the end here, it's going to start a Docker server inside the service that you can use inside your script. You're not supposed to use the Docker server that is on the runner. And we're going to see why in a few moments as well. So I told you common pitfalls, there are a lot of traps around the security products. The first one is not using the right runners. I said that a lot of times, multiple runners are set up on the, the self state instance and when the job is running, it's not using the privileged runners. So make sure that the right tags are uh, in place and the right runners are being used. Um, the second one is not using the doc, is using the Docker executor, but not privileged. So as I told you, having this line here, privilege equals true, is essential. Otherwise, <clears throat> Docker will run, but it's, it's going to fail eventually. Um, the third one is also pretty common, and uh, I'm going to have a full slide on that, mounting the Docker socket. It's pretty confusing because if you read the doc, the official doc of GitLab, there are many mentions of mounting the Docker socket into the runner. So it's super confusing because you might think if I want to run a privileged runner, I should mount the Docker socket. It really makes sense, right? I'm not that much. It's actually this line that you see at the top of the screen. Uh, you have the var run docker .soc mounted to the same file inside the runner container. So every runner is actually a container. But you have to understand and the, the whole picture and we're going to drill down to details. On the host, we have a Docker server and that Docker server will run um, the, the Docker, um, sorry, the, the GitLab runner. When we run a job with the Docker service, we want to have our own Docker server so that we are completely isolated from the host. When you run a job like the SaaS job, inside the job, we are running Docker itself to call SaaS because we want to move the local directory to a slash TMP. It's oversimplified. It's not exactly the same, but you get the idea. We are running Docker inside uh, the, the Docker of the GitLab runner. The problem is when you do that, the Docker socket that you are using is not the one that you think, it's not the one of the Docker service, it's the one on the host. So not only you are creating a security issue because your jobs are going to run directly on the host, but also when the job is running, this PWD, so the current directory that you have there, it's not exactly the one that they're thinking of. In the context of the job, this folder contains a lot of files and all the files can be mounted in there. But on the host, guess what? This folder doesn't exist. With the, the, the Docker server on the host doesn't have any clue about this PWD, the slash build slash your project. So in the end, it's going to end up with empty deer. You're expecting to see a lot of files and you don't see anything. And that's a common question that we have. It's an MTDR, what's, what's going on? My, my SAS job doesn't see any of my files. It's because of this, you are talking to the wrong Docker server. This one doesn't know anything about your project. So that's probably the most common pitfall that we're seeing. And I will take questions on that uh, a bit later. 
Um, so Docker and Docker is really helpful for us. It helps to isolate the, the containers, the context, and a lot of matters, but it has, it has a lot of drawbacks, and that's why we want to get rid of it. First of all, if I take back my uh, overall picture of the Docker uh, executor in the GitHub runner, we have one Docker server here, one Docker server in the, um, in the GitHub runner itself that will be spin off and shut down for every build. And in the SaaS job here, we are using Docker run, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is when we do that, um, the images are going to be pulled on the GitLab runner Docker server. So if I have, for example, Java and Python, and I took, uh, that's uh, uh, Sam's image, by the way, I know it's not the right one, logo, that's a private joke. Uh, if you are using the JavaScript analyzer and the Python analyzer that are going to be downloaded and run inside this context, but guess what? After your build, when, once the job is done, all this context is going to be removed. So all the Docker server here and its data is going to be completely wiped off from the host. And so there is no more Python and JavaScript analyzer images anywhere. There, the, the cache doesn't, doesn't persist anymore. So if I want to run the SaaS job again, I will have to run that and to download again the images. So if I have a lot of images and a lot of analyzers, I have to download that every time. So it's not great for the cache, but it's not the main reason why we have complaints about customers on Docker and Docker. The main reason is because that's demo time. So I will stop sharing from there and share my terminal instead. All right, let's make that a lot bigger. Even bigger than that. Okay, so um, let's take a very tiny example. Uh, let's say I want to run Alpine on my machine. I'm on the Mac here. It's pretty straightforward. Oh, that can run, sorry. See my time is always on. I don't have that locally. All right, here I'm inside the container itself. So you might think I'm completely isolated. It's actually the case, unless there is a zero vulnerability inside Docker, I can wipe out, for example, the, the slash user folder without any problem. It's going to crash my uh, exit the container, oops, if I exit the container and restart again, I will have a fresh new version of that container. So that's cool. The thing is, inside this container, I have a bunch of files that are specific to this container. So for example, here, I don't have any access to uh, any device that would be on the host for security reasons. But if I do the same, if I run, uh, privileged. If I run the same container in a privileged mode, then look at that. I have something different here. And I can even, oh, there is a device here. See that? I can access this device. What's this device? It's actually the boot device um, from my virtual machine. So Docker on Mac on macOS is running inside the virtual machine. If you don't know that, you can check out the, the Docker documentation. So that's why this device here that I'm seeing is the one inside the VM, but I'm already outside of the container. So I can crash this device. It's going to crash my world Docker installation. It's not really a big deal for my host, my Mac machine instead. But guess what is going to occur on a Linux server or any self-hosted installation? If I do that, I'm outside of the container. That means if I'm able to access the device, the hard drive and uh, any other device, basically root on, on the host. And the same goes, for example, for the proc file system. Um, let me... Uh, 
is that all right just for copy pass it will be easier for example if i check the swappiness parameter i can change that let's make a 61 to this to this file if i cut it it's 61 if i get out of the container so i here on the host i run another container if I do the same here, you see that I changed the parameter directly on the host. I'm changing the, the, the behavior of the host. So that means, yes, I'm basically root on the host and you certainly don't want to do that. And that's why our customers are not really happy with Docker and Docker because it creates some security flows and they have to be very careful about that. So they likely, they, they will not install Docker and Docker because they want the, the security products. And so that's the end of my presentation. Do you have any questions? I hope it makes sense. Hey, this is DT. I'll jump in with a quick question. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide where it showed the mounting of the, 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 the socket being the, the same? Yeah, this one. And this was great. I'm going to have to go through this presentation one more time to get some of the finer details. But, but can you explain that? that dual the the mounting there and is that the part of the core problem of the the visibility between the the, the runner and the the host and is that a requirement it's absolutely not a requirement it's actually one of the pitfalls if you do that if you move this volume to the to the github runner yeah. um docker instance you're going to use the the, the the socket on the host so you're going to use this server and this server will actually be you know just on this side and it, you can't actually hit it that's right that's right you mounted that and that's since it's mounted there when this server is going to start it's going to say oh it's there is already a file there is a server running i'm stopping there so, so this that, server is actually not existing Exactly. So is that volume specification? Is that something that's default or we documented it or like, how do we get that, that pitfall? Uh, it's not by default, but I saw that multiple times in the, in the documentation. Got it. And that's why I, I also saw some customers being super confused because they started to configure GitLab. I would say the, the regular way with a Docker executor, et cetera. And they discovered afterwards that they need some privileged runners for the security features. And at that point, they, have, they still have the first runners that they have set up and they are trying to set up this new one. And in the documentation, if they are not on the right page, they will probably see that. And they think it's a good idea to move this, this socket. But actually, it's not. If you do that, it's, it's not going to work at all. That's a quick smell for troubleshooting there, indeed. Exactly. OK, thank you. If you see an empty deer, if, if the result of the scan is empty, probably that. First thing, check that, check if the, the volume is mounted. Uh, it's likely to be the reason. Okay. If you understand this kind of Russian doors um, paradigm where you have a Docker running Docker that will run Docker, <laughs> if you understand exactly where you are in, at which level, it's going to be a lot easier. And here you can see that we are bypassing com completely the layers that the job itself is running directly on the host. Exactly. exactly. Absolutely not good. Okay, great. Thank you. I was expecting questions on, uh, on gitlab.com security. Uh, that's weird. Because we are running the security checks on gitlab.com itself. That means we are using privileged runners on GitLab.com. So with what I've just shown you, it should tickle your curiosity, actually. Anyone knows how it's working on GitLab.com? I can jump in there quickly. Um, I think uh, 
<laughs> it, it, works, it works a bit the same as what you were showing with your local VM. Um, so um, all the jobs are run in a separate uh, virtual machine and in that virtual machine there's a Docker running. So we are not so much concerned about if um, a job is being able to break out of its Docker. You're absolutely right, Bernice. Thank you for that. So it's part of the what we call the auto scaling feature on the on the GitHub runner. Auto scaling means we are going to spin off as many uh, runners as we need. But the point is we are also able to uh, spin off runners for every build. So all the runners have a configuration uh, with the max build set to one. So one runner is used to one build and one only. So there is no uh, way of collision, for example, a runner can be used twice for two jobs and we don't, we don't have to care about isolation between the jobs anymore because we are spinning off a, a full VM for the job and you can see that we are adding uh, another layer to the, the Russian, uh, the Russian door um, system that we have here. Uh, the, the wall host is going to be wiped out right after the job. So we don't care if there is a security issue and uh, the user can get out of the, the Docker container. All right, any other questions? Yes, follow up question to what you just said. Um, you were saying customers don't like to run um, privileged mode, understandably. But uh, would it be a model uh, to run it like uh, we do it on um, GitLab.com in a virtual machine? Absolutely. Uh, there is a way to achieve that, and we are a good example. But it's really, really tedious for our customers to have uh, virtual machines being created and wiped out. It's a full new environment if they want to get started. And that's usually one of the, the the drawback of having Docker and Docker, we are dealing with customers that are evaluating Ultimate. So they are in the process of a POC and they don't have unlimited resources. They don't have unlimited time. And doing that kind of work around, it's, it's really time consuming. So you want to do that if you have a very stable architecture right? like we have on GitHub.com. But if it's just to evaluate the security features, that's a lot of overhead. So that's why they generally prefer to just remove the SAS, for example, layer, the SAS request layer, and run directly the analyzer on the project so that they don't have to create any privileged runners. I have a question about our SAS orchestrator that will uh, go into history, but uh, it has a convenient detection functionality. Uh, so uh, are there any plans uh, to somehow uh, recreate this functionality to benefit from automatic detection of the project by different uh, images of analyzers? Uh, that's, that's a great question, uh, Victor. So actually, the detection mechanism is hosted on, in every analyzer. They come up with a way of, of seeing if there is that kind of file in, uh, in the repository, I'm a compatible analyzer. So um, all, all this business logic is already hold, held uh, in, the, um, in the analyzers themselves. So in the future where we will get rid of Docker and Docker and the SAS orchestrator, all the analyzers will have to run and they will exit very quickly because they will say, I'm not compatible and they will uh, exit right away. You might think that it's not performant, but actually it's more performant than what we have today. Because all these analyzers, when you run them directly instead of inside SAS, they are going to be cached on the GitLab runner. So all the GitLab runner is, is, uh, is running. The, if you use a Docker executor and you have an image, declare in the, the image tag of the, the GitLab configuration, uh, the runner will pull this image. That it, it, this image will be stored in the file system for a long time. We don't know, I don't know exactly uh, how long, but it's going to be there. So for the next execution, it's going to pull again, but since the layers are already there and it's likely that they haven't changed, it's going to use the layers directly. 
So all the analyzers will be already there and they will exit very quickly. Also because uh, by doing that, they will run uh, simultaneously in parallel instead of sequentially like we have today in SAS. So it's, it's not perfect, but we can imagine that in the future, we can also have some uh, detection mechanism ported to the GitLab runner, but it's, it's for the future. Right now, it's going to work right away just uh, by, uh, by removing the SAS uh, layer and having the analyzer SAS as the, the first level. Does Thanks. that answer your question? Yes, perfectly. Awesome. We are at time. Is there any last question? I might answer. All right. I really hope that was useful for you and for the, the customer success and, and support team. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out on Slack on our uh, G Secure channel. I will be happy to answer that. And with that, I will wish you a happy end of the day. See you all. Bye bye. Thanks, Philippe.